All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for taking some time this afternoon to discuss the top five things you need to know about guardianship. My name is John Finch. I am the director of Florida's ABLE program, ABLE United. Uh, and with me, I have a very special gift. Uh, guest, Kimberly Soto, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to uh, come and talk to us about all things guardianship. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Um, I love guardianship, so I'm excited to talk about it. Awesome, awesome. So so Kimberly is a native of Boston, Massachusetts, and we were chit-chatting before we went live. Uh, her husband's a native Floridian, so I guess he convinced you to, to say, hey, come back to the warmer weather. Uh, yeah. But uh, she's been in uh, influence since 2004, has the SOTO law form. Uh, and basically the premise of that, that law form is to advise clients and assist uh, clients in matters related to business, civil, family, guardianship, probate, trust, estates, and real estate law. Uh, and she's got numerous awards for her awesomeness. Uh, the AVO Clients uh, Choice Award, which is, a, is, a, is an organization that kind of rates lawyers. She's got a 9.0 top rating in there for the last three years. Uh, she's also was selected as one of Florida's super law rising stars that uh, only two and a half percent of attorneys uh, get that rating. So, so congratulations, Kimberly. I know we're going to look forward to you. Uh, and so uh, before we jump into Kimberly's presentation, I want to do a couple polls and then we're just going to do a high level overview on ABLE accounts just because I want to make sure we get the premise of that. Uh, and so if you have joined, you're in audio uh, listen mode only, so uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, but we do have a questions box. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to go in there, type your questions, uh, let me know that you can hear me okay if you would like, uh, but that's the best way to go in there uh, and to get your questions and we'll uh, save some time at the end to uh, answer those. So thank you all so much. Um, please note this webinar is for informational and educational purposes only. Uh, we know not uh, every situation is the same, and so we request that uh, you take this information, and if you have uh, additional, more specific questions, that you should go seek uh, a legal professional or financial or tax professional about your unique situations. Uh, but with that, I, I wanted to do a couple of polls to make this a little more interactive and to get a baseline understanding of where everybody's at. So the first one that I'm going to launch is, how familiar are you with ABLE accounts? So have you heard about the program before? And um, hopefully most of you, uh, you, you heard about the webinar through our uh, email database, but want to get some, uh, just some feedback and, and see kind of where everybody was at. And that will help me as I hopefully do a brief presentation on ABLE accounts. So I'll give everybody a few seconds to answer. All right, looking good. So about 70% of you have voted so far. I'm giving everybody a few more seconds to get their vote in. Uh, perfect, thank you all so much for participating in that poll. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and share that just so you get a feel for where everybody's at. So uh, overall, somewhat uh, familiar to very familiar. Some of you are not familiar at all, but that's fine. We're gonna do a quick overview. Uh, and although the, the goal of this is not to be specifically on ABLE accounts, we're gonna kind of tie on how ABLE accounts and guardianship works together. Uh, and so let's go ahead and just talk about ABLE accounts real quick uh, and make sure that you guys can see my screen here. Wonderful. Uh, so ABLE accounts, what are they? Well, uh, well if, if you haven't heard, ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience Act. It's based on some legislation that was passed uh, back in 2014. Each state kind of had to set up their own ABLE program. Uh, but what it is, it's a tax advantage savings and investment account specifically designed for the disability community with the big benefits that not impacting benefits. Here in the state of Florida, we launched in 2016 and we're run by the Florida Prepaid College Board. Uh, and so as we, uh, if you think of ABLE accounts, they're kind of similar to other financial products that exist. Think of checking, a savings, a 529 college savings plan, and even a special needs trust, kind of all those unique benefits rolled into one. So who qualifies for an ABLE account? Uh, we are unique, and since we are state of Florida's program, we are limited to Florida residents at the time of application. The other two are true of all ABLE programs is first, the individual has to have a diagnosis prior to age 26, and that diagnosis has to be severe. So they could be receiving SSI or SSDI and qualify. If they're not on those benefit programs, 
they basically have to have a, a physician's letter uh, saying they have a diagnosis that has marked and physical uh, mental impairments. Um, and so those, those are requirements uh, for the IRS. So what are the advantages of an ABLE account? Um, and some things you need to know is that the beneficiary is the owner of the account, uh, which is unique. So, um, you know, if they're uh, of age or adult, they can manage their own account, but somebody else can manage their account on their behalf uh, if they choose to. And we'll talk about that with guardianship. Uh, generally, funds in the ABLE account are going to take an out ABLE account. Do not count as a resource for Medicaid or SSI benefits. Anybody can contribute to the account, including the beneficiary can put their own money in. Uh, family and friends contribute. It's kind of like an online investment or savings account. Uh, and the funds can be used for a variety of expenditures and they can grow tax free. So it's pretty cool. Uh, just a really useful tool. Um, I usually tell people if you think of a health savings account, imagine this as a disability savings account with an investment thing and no pre approval to make withdrawals. So, how do individuals get started with Florida's ABLE program? It's all online, ableunited.com. There you would go to enroll. You're going to need some identification information, uh, social, date of birth. If somebody is opening this on your behalf, we're going to need their information as well. You're also going to have um, documentation, which we'll talk about uh, guardianship, but if someone's doing this for an adult beneficiary, we need to verify that you have the capacity to serve uh, in this uh, realm as, as their uh, either guardian power of attorney. Uh, you also need some banking information. That's the primary mechanism for getting money in and out of the account. And you get to select the investment options with a minimum $25 contribution when you first enroll. So what are those investment and savings options? So uh, it's pretty broad and it's really based on the needs of most investors. And so they could be individual fund options. You see there on the right side where it's uh, a money market and an FDIC savings option, a uh, U.S. stock or U.S. bond managed by Vanguard or an international stock. Uh, but our more popular options are on the left, um, portfolio options, kind of the we do it for you. It's a, it's a risk-based, different investment options, conservative, moderate, and uh, growth. And so um, you get to pick and choose between any or all of the investment products, and you can really cater this to, to your specific savings or investment goals, whether that be short-term or long-term. Uh, and the great thing is you can get that money out when you need to. Uh, and what you're going to be using the ABLE account for is primarily to help pay for just about anything that's going to help improve or maintain independence or quality of life. So this could be weekly groceries, uh, housing, education, assistive technology, uh, even financial uh, uh, fees or even legal fees, like maybe setting up guardianship if that's possible or, or something that might need to happen, uh, or even transportation. So it's pretty broad, and as long as you use it for those expenditures, uh, any earnings on the account are tax-free. So it's a pretty cool, uh, um, so that that is it in the nutshell. And so I'm gonna go ahead and end my presentation for now uh, and, and really talk, uh, bring on uh, Kimberly here to talk about guardianship now and how uh, guardians can utilize ABLE accounts. Uh, but we're gonna kind of do the top five things. I think that's what people are most interested in. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make Kimberly the, presenter here. Uh, and while we're getting that set up, I'm going to go ahead and share the next poll is how familiar are you with guardianship? So, so uh, you know, maybe you're not familiar at all. And this is a kind of a introduction. Maybe you're somewhat familiar. Maybe you're very familiar, have a very specific question you have. Uh, but go ahead and take a moment, answer this quick poll, and that, that will help Kim really as she kind of uh, walks us through guardianship and the things we need to know. So I'll give everybody a few moments to put their answer in. Some really great participation. We're at almost 75%. I'm going to give everybody a few more seconds to put their, their vote in here. Uh, all right. Let me share those results so Kimberly can see as well. So overall, pretty good, somewhat familiar, very familiar, very familiar, kind of similar to when we did the ABLE poll. Uh, well, this is great. So hopefully this will uh, be very educational for all. I know it will be for me. And so I'm going to turn this over to Kimberly to uh, talk about the top five things. Go ahead, Kimberly. 
Awesome, great. Um, well, I'm excited to be here. And so we're gonna be going through um, the top five things that you need to know about guardianship. Um, we'll hopefully have time for a few Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have any questions that you wanna submit, feel, please feel free to do that. Um, so I'm Kimberly Soto. Um, I'm the owner of the Soto Law Office. I've been um, a licensed attorney in Florida since 2011. So my 10 year anniversary is actually November 1st. Um, and I've been practicing guardianship um, probably for the last seven or eight years. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to go over are the types of guardianship that can be filed. Hey, Kim so Kimberly, Kimberly, real quick, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble seeing your screen. It's just a blank white page. I don't know if anybody else is having that issue. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. So I guess when I play from start, it doesn't show it. But I can just click through. There you go. All right. That will work. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is types of guardianship. Um, so there are a few different types that can be filed in Florida. Um, so the first thing that you would need to determine, and you can always work with your attorney to actually figure out what is appropriate. Um, you're, you don't have to know, you know, what type you're supposed to do. If you're not licensed or familiar in law, you can certainly seek out the guidance of either myself um, or another attorney. So the first option that you have to pick between is whether you're going to file for what's called a limited or a plenary guardianship. So a limited guardianship means that the guardian would actually only be granted certain decision-making abilities over the ward, but that the ward is going to retain their rest of the decision-making abilities that aren't given to the guardian. And one type of limited guardianship is guardian advocacy, um, which we're gonna go into a little bit more details of that later. Um, if you file for plenary guardianship, which is different than limited, um, that's when the guardian has full decision-making rights over the ward. Um, so you do actually pick between the two of those. You either file for limited or you file for plenary. Then you have to decide whether you are going to file a guardianship over a person, over their property, or over both person and property. So the differences with that are that if you file guardianship over a person, you're really talking about kind of their physical body. Where can they live? go to school, what activities can they participate in, um, their medical decisions, what doctors they can see, medications they can take. Um, so when you're talking about guardianship over a person, you're really talking about kind of their physical body and what they're allowed to do and where they're allowed to reside. If you're looking at guardianship over property, um, when we talk about property and anytime that I reference property throughout this um, presentation, I'm talking about any assets that the ward owns. So anything of monetary value that belongs solely to the ward. Um, so I'm not actually talking just about real property or a piece of property that has a house on it. Um, we're really encompassing kind of all of their assets. Um, you can also file for guardianship of both the person and property. So that's when someone needs their personal day-to-day -day decisions being made for them, but then they also have assets um, that have to be governed. Um, so those are the different types of guardianship that you can file. So you would either pick limited or plenary, and then you also pick either person or property or both. Um, so you do have to make those two separate decisions before you even go to file the paperwork. And the times that you would want to file for guardianship um, are when someone has lost um, their decision to make, their ability to make decisions for themselves. Um, so this comes in a lot where we see um, late stage dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, if someone has a stroke or is in a coma, so they're just unable to number one, either communicate their needs, um, but number two, also even make the decisions based on an understanding of what those decisions mean. Um, other cases, something that would be a guardianship for just property would be if a minor child, you know, received an inheritance, um, either from a life insurance policy or a direct distribution. Um, in Florida, minors don't have the capacity to own assets. Um, so if they kind of come into some assets, then a guardianship would be needed. And then, of course, we're going to go to um, a minor with a developmental disability who's about to turn 18 um, or one that is over 18 and maybe has moved to Florida. 
um, or now something has come up where a guardianship is needed. And so that would be when guardian advocacy applies. And so when I talk about these general types of guardianship, um, I'm really talking generally guardianship. If we're talking just about guardian advocacy, it's a very specific type of guardianship. And so Florida statute is very clear as to when you can file for guardian advocacy versus the other types of guardianship that we talked about. It is a type of limited guardianship. So if you have someone who needs plenary guardianship or we also refer to that as full guardianship, then guardian advocacy would not be a problem, would not be an option um, because guardian advocacy only grants the guardian a handful of decision-making rights over the ward. So in order to qualify for a guardian advocacy, there has to be a disorder or syndrome, which is literally listed in the statute, and it has to be one of those. It has to manifest before the age of 18, and it has to constitute a substantial handicap that's expected to continue indefinitely. Um, so this would be a diagnosis that has to, you know, be a formal diagnosis by a, you know, a licensed physician, a hospital, you know, something of that means um, that did man manifest before the age of 18. Now, it's okay if when you file, um, we get asked a lot of times, um, for example, someone moves to Florida um, and so their child is 36. Um, you do not have to file for guardian advocacy before the child turns 18 or even around the time they turn 18. Um, you can file this at any time during their lifetime. It's just that the disorder or syndrome has to have manifested before the age of 18. So that's the important um, distinction for the 18 age. Um, actually, I want to go over one more thing. Um, so timing can be important if you are um, having a child or a ward who's reaching the age of 18. So in Florida, parents are the natural guardians over children. But once they turn 18, parents are no longer the guardians. They're no longer legally considered to be guardians. And so the issue usually comes up where people are living in Florida, a family's in Florida, um, and the child with a developmental disability is going to turn 18. And so now the parents can't make decisions for them, can't speak to the doctors, can't be involved in any medical decisions. And so what Florida does allow you to do is once the child is 17 and a half years old, you can actually file for guardian advocacy. So we can get all of the paperwork straightened away, get everything completed and file the paperwork with the court asking one or both of the parents to be appointed guardian going forward. The court can enter an order and letters of guardianship, and those will actually take effect once the child turns 18. So then there's no lapse in, you know, a six months or a year long period um, where the child is now an adult but still needs guardianship. Um, so Florida statute actually does really help um, us with that process and to streamline it. Okay, so I want to go over, now that we've figured out what type of guardianship to file, is how to file. So I'm going to talk about general guardianship and then guardian advocacy separately. So in a general guardianship, you have to file a petition to appoint a guardian, and that's going to have its own case number. So it has its own filing fee that you file with the clerk, and then you're also going to have to file a petition to determine incapacity. So that's actually a separate case number, a separate filing fee. Under the petition to determine incapacity, that's when you're asking the court to actually determine that the ward is incapacitated and therefore unable to make at least some of their decisions on their own. Now, that's a huge burden for the court to take on because they really wanna make sure that if they're declaring someone incapacitated, they really wanna make sure that they are, that they do not have the mental capacity legally under Florida statute to make decisions for themselves. So the court will actually appoint a three-member committee. The three-member committee um, will meet with the ward, will look over the doctor's reports, potentially meet with physicians and family members, um, maybe meet with the potential guardian, and then each of the committee members puts a report together to the court, telling the court basically from their point of view whether a guardianship is appropriate and then whether it should be plenary, which is a full guardianship, or whether it should be limited. Um, and so the courts really rely on these committee reports because they're supposed to have the full picture. And 
everything that's supposed to be available of them, whoever they can talk to, whatever records they can review. And so they are taking it upon themselves to say, yes, we have done our due diligence. And here are the reasons why we think a guardianship either is appropriate or on the flip side, why a guardianship would not be appropriate at this time. The two cases actually work together. So once the three reports of the committee are in, then we can set the petition to determine incapacity for hearing, but you also have to set the petition to appoint a guardian for hearing at the same time. The reason for that is that once the court declares someone to be incapacitated, then they have to appoint a guardian. Um, they can't just allow someone to be deemed incapacitated and not able to make their decisions, but then not actually address someone else to have the authority to make those decisions. So that's in a kind of what I would refer to as a traditional guardianship. So in the carve out for a guardian advocacy, it's actually a simpler um, process. So what happens is a petition for appointment of guardian is filed. There's no separate case, so there's no separate petition to determine incapacity. The petition for appointment of guardian is filed with a physician's report, basically certifying that the ward does meet all the requirements of the statute. So there's no committee appointed. The ward is not actually declared incapacitated. Um, the physician's report basically serves as the three-member committee report, and that serves to tell the judge yes. The ward actually does qualify for guardian advocacy, and so then what the judge looks to is, okay, let's turn then straight to the petition for appointment of guardian. Who has been asked to be appointed as guardian, and do they qualify? Um, so that's really the only thing that the judge is addressing in a guardian advocacy. Now, of course, when I talk about these things, I'm talking more about uncontested cases, and uncontested cases means there's not a third party coming in and disputing who has filed for guardianship or disputing that a guardianship is needed. Um, in those cases, then of course, kind of everything will be before the court. Um, in a guardian advocacy, let's say if you know one parent files for guardian advocacy, but another parent um, doesn't think it's appropriate or a family member doesn't think it's appropriate, they could file an objection to that. Um, and then that would go forward on a hearing. The judge would actually look at all the evidence, would have to weigh all of the evidence to determine whether um, a guardianship is appropriate or not. And then if they determine a guardianship is appropriate, who the guardian should be. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about now that we figured out what type of guardianship to file and how to file it is who can be appointed as guardian. So the proposed guardian is always gonna be the person who's filing everything. Um, they're gonna be the petitioner, they're the one setting forth basically their case through all of the paperwork that either they've completed um, or they've worked with an attorney to complete. So you are qualified to act as a guardian if you're a resident of this state who has full legal capacity, which means that you have mental capacity to make not only your own decisions, but then arguably the decisions of someone else and you're 18 years or older. This is a pretty broad spectrum, um, so it's not required that it be a family member. Um, as long as the person who wants to be guardian is a resident of the state of Florida and has mental capacity and is over the age of 18, they can ask for guardianship over someone else. Um, so it doesn't have to be a parent, it doesn't have to be a relative, it doesn't have to be a family friend or neighbor. Um, so it just has to be a resident with mental capacity who is over 18. So we get a lot of those questions um, if like both of the parents have passed away, um, you know, can a family member be it or if there's a family friend maybe who has stepped into that role um, as an unofficial guardian, they can actually file for full guardianship through the courts. Now, if it's someone who is a non-resident who wants to be appointed, then we're looking at a much smaller um, batch of people. So the person who wants to be guardian has to be directly related to the ward. Um, and so that's like a spouse, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, niece, or nephew, or a legally adopted child or adopted parent of the ward, or the spouse of anyone who qualifies under this section. Now there is still kind of a caveat where if someone is incapacitated or needs a guardian advocacy and the court has to find someone to appoint, they and no one fits into any of these categories, they can try and work around and find someone. Um, so these though are just, if you are a non-resident, 
these are really the categories that you need to fit in in order to um, try to be appointed as the guardian. So there is also a preference list. So Florida statute actually lists this and lives out who would have preference to be appointed as a guardian. Um, so that comes into play when there are competing petitions for appointment of a guardian. So let's say that um, I file a petition uh, to be appointed guardian over my niece. Well, maybe another family member thinks that they would be better served as a guardian. So they also file a petition for appointment in the same case number. Um, and so then we would have to go to court um, to determine who would be more appropriate to be appointed. Um, if it would be, let's say, instead of a family member filing a petition, let's say maybe a professional guardian um, or a hospital um, had filed for guardianship through a professional guardian, um, then the court is going to look to this list um, as to who gets preference. Preference does not mean automatic appointment. It's just simply a preference that the courts are going to look to. So they're always going to look to a family member. Um, so someone related by blood, marriage, or adoption to the ward, um, those are always automatically going to have a leg up. Um, now, they can still be unqualified, or a court could still find that someone else is more qualified. So it's not a guarantee, but it's certainly a helpful um, step up to have. Then the next thing the court is going to consider is who has relevant educational, professional, or business experience. Um, so that all goes into who would be best able to serve as a gar guardian to meet the needs of the ward. Um, the next thing the court is going to consider is the capacity to manage the finances involved. So if we're talking about um, guardianship of someone's property, um, you know, someone who maybe has filed bankruptcy five times or who has been um, maybe found to committed some fraud or, you know, has some arrest records of stealing, a court might not look to them to be appointed guardian because they may feel that they're not the appropriate one. Um, you know, so these are some concerns that the court can take into account. And then the last one is kind of a catch-all. Um, does the guardian have the ability to meet the requirements of the law to actually be a guardian and also meet the unique needs of the individual? Um, because courts are always going to look to the individual ward and what is in their best interest. So we're always looking to make sure that the ward is protected. Um, the court can also consider the wishes previously expressed by the ward. So that could either be um, done if the ward had, let's say, signed what's called a pre-need guardian form. It's part of an estate planning package. Um, and if they actually designated who they either want or do not want to be their guardian if they ever needed one appointed. Um, if the ward, let's say, is not fully incapacitated and so it still has moments of lucidity or is still able to communicate on certain levels, um, they can make their preference known as to who they wish to be appointed. And then, of course, if for some reason the ward, you know, it didn't make their wishes known and now can't, um, the court can look to the next of kin, the closest living relatives, um, friends, and, you know, determine, okay, who has maybe the ward told or talked about um, who they would like to be appointed as their guardian. Um, so these are kind of all of the options that the court is going to look at when determining who best to serve as a guardian. So now that we went through who can serve, um, there are certain people per statute who are just 100% disqualified from serving. So you cannot serve as a guardian if someone has been convicted of a felony, if they've been judicially determined to have committed abuse, abandonment, or neglect against a child, if they are incapable of discharging the duties of guardian because of their own incapacity or an illness, or they are, and once again, this is a catch-all, if they are otherwise unsuitable to perform the duties of a guardian. Um, so this really does give the judges some cut and dry rules that they have to follow, but then also gives them a lot of leeway in determining, okay, based on the facts before the court, based on the information the court has available, is this person suitable to be a guardian or not? And so they really can look at the whole picture. Um, they can look at reports and evidence that's admitted. Um, and then of course they can listen to testimony. Um, so family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers um, of either the ward or the guardian can all come and testify and explain to a judge why or why not someone should be appointed as guardian. So as part of the guardianship process, 
whoever is asking to be appointed as a guardian, they do have to go through a background check. So it is a level two background screening and it is a credit history investigation and a criminal history investigation. Um, so those are two things that once a case is filed, the clerk has a specific, what's called an ORI number that will be given to either the law firm or the proposed guardian who's filing. And then they will take that to whatever fingerprinting um, company is able to have their fingerprints taken. You have to actually give the ORI number to the place that you're having your fingerprints taken because that way they'll actually make sure that once the fingerprints are done, it's gonna get linked to the clerk of the court and then get linked to your actual case number. Um, because we can't move forward on a final hearing until if it's a traditional guardianship that the three committee reports are filed and then regardless of what type of guardianship it is, we have to have the background investigation done. And then also something to remember um, is if you've put a pause or a hold or a freeze um, on any of your credit scores, you actually have to unfreeze them to allow the clerk to run the credit history report. Once it's run, then you can refreeze them. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. All right. So now I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So assuming we have gone through the whole process, so we have filed all of the paperwork, we have succeeded in completing all the requirements, we've had the final hearing where the judge has determined the ward is incapacitated to some extent or has granted a guardian advocacy, and the judge has decided who, to, who is appointed as guardian. So now that someone is appointed as guardian, there are quite a few requirements for them to do. So if someone is appointed the guardian of a person, they have to complete a minimum of eight hours of instruction and training. Um, all of the different counties have their own list of providers that offer these classes. Um, so the clerk actually has a list that they either provide to the law firms or can provide to the guardians directly um, in order to complete the instruction and training. If someone is appointed the guardian of property, then they actually have to take a four hour class of instruction and training. There are instances very few though, where you can actually ask for this requirement to be waived. Um, it really depends on the counties and the individual judges whether they're gonna grant that. Um, I will tell you there's been a little bit of an upheaval recently with guardianship. Um, so judges are kind of erring on the side of caution and not wanting to waive these requirements. They do actually want the guardians to go through them to make sure that they understand their responsibilities, what their rights are, what they're required to do. Um, but for example, if let's say someone moved from another state to Florida and then they had to, let me back up a little bit. If someone moves from another state to Florida and let's say that they had a guardianship, they were appointed guardian over a ward in that state. When they move to Florida, Florida actually acts as its own little world. So they have to start the process over again and go through everything that we've already discussed. So they file for a guardianship here, they file for you know, the petition to be appointed as a guardian, they go through all of the requirements, all of the background checks, if the three committee um, members have to be appointed, they go through that process, and then at the end, once they're appointed guardian in Florida, they might ask the court to please waive the guardianship requirements, because maybe they've already been a guardian for 10, 15, 20 years, so it might not be as helpful for them. Um, and then that would be up to an individual judge to determine whether they feel that the background and history they've had is sufficient or whether they really feel that the guardian needs to go through the Florida-specific training. Um, because Florida does have its own rules. It, you know, it varies from state to state, whether you need guardianship and what instances you need guardianship, how guardianship works. Um, so I would always kind of err on the assumption that these guardian that these educational requirements are going to have to be completed. Okay. So once you've been appointed guardian and you've taken the classes or you're in the process of taking the classes, the other requirement that you have to satisfy is that within 60 days after receiving the letters of guardianship, and the letters actually are telling you, telling the world that you are the guardian. There's also an accompanying order that is issued by the judge. So the orders and letters really work together. Um, but the letters are the certified copies that actually allow you to make decisions on behalf of the ward. So within 60 days of receiving the letters from the court, the guardian of property has to file a verified inventory. 
if someone is appointed the guardian of the person, then they have to file what's called an initial guardianship plan. So these are two different requirements. Um, and of course, they can be in the same case. So if you have a case where you have been appointed guardian of person and property, then you will have to file both of these forms within 60 days. The initial guardianship plan um, is pretty standard and straightforward. It goes over the medical, mental, personal care, and social services of the ward. Um, so it's things like where are they going to reside? What activities are they going to partake in so that um, their quality of life is as best as it can be? The place of residence, what physicians are going to be seeing, things like that. The verified inventory, and this is when we're talking about the property of the ward. And when I say property, I mean all of the assets owned by the ward. So the verified inventory has to list um, all of the real and personal property, including cash assets that the world has. Um, the location of the actual real and personal property. So that could be um, property addresses. So if they actually own houses, it would be the address of the property. Um, if they have checking or savings accounts, it would be including the information for those accounts. Um, mutual funds, stocks, investments, all of that would have to be included on the verified inventory. And then also a description of all sources of income. So are they receiving social security benefits, pensions? Um, are they receiving income through something else? And then you also have to give the court the supporting documentation to prove what you are setting forth as the assets of the ward. Um, so for example, that might be a copy of the property appraiser that says what the value of the real property is, because um, the property appraiser puts on certified values. Um, if it's banking or checking accounts, it's gonna be the actual bank statements. Um, same with mutual funds, it's gonna be the actual financial statements. And yes, the clerk does go through them. They actually will double check the supporting documentation against the inventory to make sure that it matches and makes sense and they will do it down to the penny. Um, so if you are the guardian of property, you really do have to make sure that the financials are completely set up and are being kept correctly. So now that you've gotten through kind of the initial paperwork and the initial plan, every single year the guardian has to file paperwork the rationale for that is the courts and the judges and the legislature take guardianship very seriously through a guardianship they are taking away rights that are naturally awarded to a person so those rights are being taken away and given to a third party regardless of whether it's a parent a family member a friend a professional guardian a company they have taken someone's rights and have given those rights to someone else. So the courts wanna make sure that basically there's no funny business going on, that the ward is being treated correctly, being taken care of, and their assets are being protected and being used for their benefit. So the guardian of a person has to file an annual guardianship plan. So that's gonna lay out kind of everything that we went through in the initial plan. So where the person is living, kind of what daily activities they're participating in, um, what doctors they're seeing, what medical things might be going on, and it also has a physician's report attached to it. So if you are the guardian of a person, the ward actually has to be seen by a doctor every single year, and that doctor has to fill out a report that's going to be attached to the, to the annual guardianship plan to be submitted to the court. The annual guardianship plan also asks a couple questions. For example, it asks whether the annual plan was reviewed with the ward. Sometimes it's going to be no. Sometimes the ward just doesn't have the capacity to understand the annual plan. Um, they're not gonna be able to share it with the guardian or have a meaningful conversation about what is being included in it. So it's okay for sometimes that answer to be no. Um, the other question is also gonna be, has the ward regained any of their capacity? And so should they regain any of their rights? Or under a guardian advocacy, are there any rights that now they should be given back because there has been a change in circumstance? So the annual guardianship plan is really important. It's really important that it's filed timely. Um, so there are certain requirements of when it needs to be filed. Um, there are actually two different times that it can be filed and it depends on what county the case is in um, and we always you know my firm our policy is we always double check with the clerks um, whenever we have a new guardianship to make sure that we are on the same timeline as them to make sure we don't miss any requirements 
Now, switching to if someone is appointed the guardian of property, they have to file an annual accounting. So the annual accounting will start with the number from last year. So it starts with either the initial plan number or initial inventory number or the annual accounting for the prior year, puts that number at the top and then literally goes through and accounts for every single credit or debit made to any asset that the ward owns. You also, once again, have to support all of the documentation. Um, there is a fee for the clerk to review the annual accounting, and that does depend on the value of the assets. And yes, the clerks do go through all of the supporting documentation to make sure that it matches up exactly to what the annual accounting says, and make sure down to the penny that every credit and debit is accounted for. Um, if it's not, you will have to explain to a judge what has happened. Um, it's an important thing to remember, if someone is appointed the guardian of property, that money is the wards. That money will usually go into a restricted account. It's a very specialized account where the money cannot be removed from that account without a court order. Um, so let's say there is um, a ward has some medical procedure coming up and $5,000 of it won't be covered by health insurance. Um, so in that case, the guardian can't just write a check from the assets of the ward. What they have to do is file a petition with the court, letting the judge know what is going on and that they would like to use the ward's assets to pay for whatever this medical procedure is that the portion of it that is not covered by insurance. Most likely, as long as it's a medically necessary or reasonably necessary uh, medical treatment, a judge will most likely grant that. Now on the flip side, let's say that the guardian wants to take the whole family to um, Disney for a week. A judge is most likely not going to allow the ward's assets to be used for that. Um, so the when someone is appointed guardian of property, those assets are actually protected. They need to be used for the benefit of the ward and they need to be cleared by a judge. Um, so that account cannot just be used as a regular checking and savings account or a regular investment account. There are actually a lot of rules um, when someone is appointed financial decision-making power over someone else. Okay, so the fourth thing I, the fourth thing I wanna go over is what is a standby guardian? So we're gonna kind of back up a little bit and go back to the beginning of the process. Um, if you are applying to be appointed as a guardian, you know, one of the things that you need to consider is if you are successful in being appointed as guardian, if something happens to you, then what happens to the ward, what happens to this guardianship case? So at the very beginning or at any point throughout the process, someone can file what's called a petition for standby guardian. And so what that does is that lets the court know, hey, I would like to be appointed as guardian, but in the event that I'm unable to, I agree that Bob should be appointed as guardian. So Bob would actually sign a joinder and waiver that they agree to be appointed as standby guardian. And so this is when the original appointed guardian is no longer able to serve. Um, at the time that a petition to, to be appointed as standby guardian is filed, there will be an order designating them as standby guardian if they meet all of the qualifications and the court agrees. However, the letters won't be issued. So the standby guardian has no power or control over any decision-making abilities of the world ward unless and until the current guardian is unable to serve, um, such as death, removal, or resignation. The court is then notified of that and then the court sees that, yes, there was an order designating them as a standby guardian. And so now they can actually issue the letters appointing the standby guardian as now the new guardian. Um, and so now that standby guardian is considered the guardian. And then they have all the rights and responsibilities, as we've previously discussed, um, over what they need to do. Um, so standby guardians are great because it helps make sure there's not really a lull um, in decision making ability. So it's someone when something happens to guardian A, guardian B is already ready to step in. Um, so this is just a really great tool to be able to use. The last thing about guardianship that I wanted to go over is can you and how do you terminate a guardianship? So if the ward wants to regain some or all of their decision-making rights, then they can ask that a guardianship is no longer appropriate. So in a guardian advocacy case, the ward or any interested person on their behalf can file what's called a restoration of rights. 
Um, and that can be a restoration of some of the rights that have been taken away or all of their rights. Um, so if the ward believes that they have capacity and that a guardianship is no longer needed, then they can petition the court um, for those restoration of rights to actually be given back to them. In the other types of guardianship, what would be filed is called a suggestion of capacity, and that can be full capacity or partial capacity. Um, so that could be in a case where maybe let's say that someone had a stroke and so a guardianship was needed. We didn't know how long the guardianship would be needed for, but a few months or years or decades later, um, the ward has regained either some or all of their mental capacity. And so the type of guardianship that they have been appointed is no longer appropriate. Then a suggestion of capacity can be filed to either give them back some or all of their rights. Um, if all of the rights are given back to the ward, then the entire guardianship is terminated. If only some rights are going to be restored to the ward, um, then revised letters, a revised order will be issued by the court, um, curtailing what the guardian's um, decision-making abilities are, what their rights and roles are. Um, so that is kind of how to partially or fully terminate a guardianship. So now I'm going to switch gears um, and go over a little bit over special needs trust. Um, so special needs trusts have to do with the property um, of someone who has a disability. And so it contains the assets of that individual with a disability and it's created for their benefit. So this allows a third party trustee to manage the funds so that someone else can actually manage the assets um, for the ward. Special needs trusts are usually outside of guardianship. So if there is a ward who has assets that are already in a special needs trust, then maybe the parent or family member um, or third party is going to file for guardianship, but only over the ward's person, because they don't need to file guardianship over the ward's property, because the property is already in a special needs trust, is already being taken care of, is already being managed by a trustee. Um, so there's no reason that the court needs to have jurisdiction or, or oversee the trust. Now, there can be times when the trust is going to be included in a guardianship, um, but that's usually if there are some concerns or if there have already been some things that have happened with either maybe commingling of the funds, maybe the funds haven't been used appropriately, maybe they've been inappropriately borrowed against. Um, so there are instances when a trust can be brought into a guardianship, but traditionally and hopefully it would be maintained as separate because nothing has gone wrong and there's no concerns or issues. Um, so a special needs trust allows the ward to receive and accumulate assets um, while also um, usually avoiding disqualification for ongoing public assistance. Um, so that's really the crux of a special needs trust um, and when it would come into play. If, um, for example, the ward has assets or is going to come into assets but is not seeking any government assistance and does not um, believed to need to seek it in the future, then instead of doing a special needs trust, um, we could do a traditional trust, a family trust, an individual trust. Um, so in the trust world of estate planning, there are many different types of trusts. And so we really look at the individual situation of the person and the family to figure out what is the best way to meet their needs. And so a special needs trust is a great tool. So I'll very briefly touch on ABLE. Um, so I know that you already had some information about it, um, but the ABLE Act is wonderful. It really allows individuals um, who developed a disability before 26. So that's a lot different than the Guardian Advocacy Statute, which you know looks at 18, um, to be able to open up accounts and really take care of some of their expenses. Um, so the ABLE Act is really just a great tool um, to use as well. But I know you already you know got some information on that. Um, so that was pretty much everything that I had to discuss with you about guardianship and I wanted to save, you know, a little bit of time for some questions. Um, so my firm, you know, obviously handles guardianship. Um, we do estate planning, family law, real estate and civil litigation. And here is our contact information. Awesome. Then, Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to put it on a different screen while we talk. Uh, Kimberly, that was that was a lot. Like that was, uh, I don't know about everybody else, but uh, guardianship is one of those things where I, I, I was saying, you know, this is the third time I've sat through a guardianship presentation. I learned something new every single time. And so 
Uh, I'm going to start with one of the last questions, and then we're going to kind of work from the top because we had quite a few questions come in. Uh, and one I want to touch on because, you know, it, it, it deals with ABLE accounts. So uh, talking about ABLE accounts, and you're talking about when it comes to the requirement to, to kind of file all that Guardian's assets uh, each year. Do, do ABLE accounts are included in there? And also do ABLE accounts, are they now a restrictive asset um, because the owner of the ABLE account is the could be the guardian or could be the ward in the situation or the individual with a disability? That's a great question. Okay, so when I talk about um, the ward's assets that have to be included in guardianship, we're really focused on assets that the ward owns in their individual name. Um, so for example, if um, let's say me and my husband, um, we have one child together um, and he has a life insurance policy that lists our minor child as the beneficiary. If he were to pass away, then I would have to open up a guardianship over my own minor child's property. And so because she was going to get a payout in her own personal name, the courts have to appoint me as guardian because the insurance company can't write a check to me because I, I'm not the beneficiary, even though I'm her mom. Um, and so those assets would be included um, in the guardianship and then have to be put in a restricted account. So what we're looking at is how is the account actually titled? Um, if it's usually titled through an ABLE account where it's in a trust or it's being managed by a third party, those are gonna fall outside. But if it's something where it is titled in the individual's name um, and there's no trustee or third party who has the authority to act over those assets, then it would need to be put into the guardianship. Okay. So, yeah. So, it will count through unique is because it, it technically the owner is the individual with the disability, but often it's a third party that's kind of managing and accessing the funds and transactions. Yep. So, so exactly. that's great. And, and questions are coming in. So, we're going to kind of back our way all the way to the very beginning and got some of these really good questions. Uh, can you touch on the difference between public and private guardianship? I know there's public guardians and then uh, a private guardianship, I'm assuming would probably be somebody that's a family member or somebody that's close, but, but what are public guardians? A public guardian could be, you know, maybe an institution or an organization that needs to be appointed. It's when we're looking at guardianship, we're looking at so many different situations that are possible. Um, of course, when we're you know referring to private guardians, it's usually going to be a family member. There's a support system. There's something in place. Um, when we're looking at public guardians, it's usually going to be someone who is either on their own, doesn't have anyone else to care for them, um, maybe has ended up in the hospital. There's no family around. There's no friends. No one is e either able to step up and take care of them or willing to. Um, so that's kind of the difference between public and private is where are the sources of support truly coming from? Um, is it someone that has resources or who knows someone who has resources that can step in? And once again, it's being a guardian is tough. It, it is a lot of work. There are a lot of responsibilities, a lot of requirements. Um, it is not for everyone. Um, yeah. And you don't want to get into a situation where you kind of go down this rabbit hole. You're now behind on the annual plans. You've you know, maybe done something wrong with the finances or the accounting, you just didn't keep track of things and now you are in trouble with the court. Um, so it is to be appointed a, a guardian is a high level of responsibility and accountability through the court system. Um, so it is definitely not a decision to be made lightly. And so it is something where, you know, if you're gonna go in and be a private guardian, you really need to sit and think, what are the requirements and can I meet those? Wow, that, that's that's good information. It's important decision point that really has to take into consideration all the aspects when it comes to being a guardian. Uh, so you touched on this on on Florida is unique. We are our own island down here in, in Southeast Florida. And so when it comes or Southeast of the uh, US. So so people coming in from out of state into Florida and have guardianship from from a different state. It's kind of almost null and void, right? Because Florida is unique in its own uh, capacity. Yeah. Uh, well, let's say. Uh, what happens if you have a child, an adult child, or somebody that's um, that you want to be guardianship, but they're outside the state of Florida? Does the guardian, I mean, I'm assuming Florida rules only applies to people here in Florida. So if you're, if you want to be a guardian for a child, let's say in Georgia, for example, I'm assuming you have to go through the Georgia procedures to, to be a guardian, correct? Yeah, so in Florida, um, so I'm only licensed in Florida, so I can only speak to what our rules are, but in Florida, we look to where the ward is residing. 
So where are they living? That will determine the state and the county that the case will be filed in. Um, so if it's someone who's living here and there's the ward is out of state, um, you would have to talk to an attorney in that state to see what the requirements are. Um, because like I said, all of the states are different. We all have different requirements. And I wanted to touch really quickly on transferring guardianship. So a lot of people say, okay, well, I have a guardianship in New York, so I'm going to transfer it to Florida. Because we're different states, our rules don't always make sense or work together very well. So the state that you're leaving may actually require the guardianship to be transferred. However, we, we would like to not accept it. We're not going to accept the transferred guardian. So usually what we do is, you know, as an attorney in Florida, we work with the attorney in that state or with the clerk in that state and say, okay, we'll start the process of opening up the guardianship here so we'll have maybe the petition opened um, but we won't have the orders or letters done you guys can then enter your order transferring it so that the court kind of loses jurisdiction over making rulings then we can come back down here we can have the orders and letters appointed so now we magically have a guardian and now you can close up the case in new york um so it's really just sometimes it's kind of working within the rules to mesh them together if they don't already work perfectly which happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, thinking about just some of the, the rules and, and regulations when it comes to defining if somebody's incapacitated to, to and needs a guardian, is there like a definition for that or is it really based up to that kind of that panel to come up with their own decision or are they kind of saying, oh, if, it, if it's IQ level of this or if there's certain uh, metrics or how does that work? No, so there's really, there's not a hard and fast rule. So the definition of incapacitated, if we want to call it that, is that you don't have the mental capacity to legally understand the ramifications of your decisions. So if, for example, when we're talking about estate planning and we have someone who wants to come in and sign a power of attorney, yeah, they may be able to look at me and tell me the day is great, maybe even tell me the year, you know, and sign their name on the document. But if they can't understand that legally they're allowing someone else to have power over their decisions, then they don't have capacity to sign that document. So that's what we're looking at. Do they fully actually understand the consequences of their actions? And it's not whether they make bad decisions. You can make bad decisions all day long. As long as you understand that they I, attest, I attest to that. I make bad decisions. <laughs> We're not all that perfect. Uh, yeah, great. That's, that's a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> yep, bad yep. decisions. All right, so some additional questions here. Uh, I really like the standby guardian, and, and it's important to know, I think we had a few questions about that, is that it's, it's any time during the process, and even after the process, right, that can, that can be established. Um, you know, uh, is there such thing as co-guardians? Can you have like, let's say you have two parents and they both want to equally have rights, you can set that up. Uh, that's yeah, good. So you can have co-guardians, you can have co-standby guardians, but just a little asterisk. Um, usually for parents, it does make sense. Um, and so we appoint those all the time. But when you're kind of getting farther away from parents, you know, when someone's appointed as co-guardian, it's going to be up to the individual judge. And some of them have hard and fast rules, whether the two guardians are required to make decisions together or whether one or the other can make a decision. But how that plays out in reality is, okay, we have two guardians who have to make decisions together. So when they don't agree, what happens? You end up back in court because now a third party can't listen to these two guardians who aren't in agreement. So now a judge has to make a decision. The judge sees you for what may be a one hour evidentiary hearing and quite frankly, doesn't know you or your family. Um, and then when you talk about, you know, one or the other has to make decisions. Okay, well, so I'm a guardian. I call up the doctor and I say, yes, prescribe them this medicine. Well, then my sister calls up the doctor the next day. No, we're not doing that medicine anymore. Cancel the prescription. So the reality of co-guardians doesn't always maybe match what the hope of it is um so we do do co-guardians it's just these are some things that you have to take into consideration or that the guardians truly have to work together you can also um appoint like one person guardian of person and then one mm -hmm. guardian of property sometimes that's an easier way to split the duties um but just remember the guardian of the person might need money and then the guardian of the property has to be the one to agree so that they can ask the court for it so uh. I know that was one of the questions was, could you split those duties up? And it sounds like you can. Let's talk a little bit about reporting. Um, I know we only have about a minute left. Uh, and so one of the, one of the a couple of recurring questions about the reporting was, you know, how strict is the court? Uh, it sounds like it definitely when it comes to the property, they're pretty strict. Um, but is there like a time life? Like what happens if you 
don't file in a timely manner or forget to file. Can they just void your guardianship or what does that what does that look like? Okay, so that's a great question. So if you don't file these reports on time, um, it does take the clerk a little while to get through the case and figure out you haven't filed it. So if you file it late, then basically the clerk goes, okay, well, you know, as long as everything's done correctly, we'll accept this, but next year do it, do it timely. Um, if you though keep waiting and don't do it, eventually you'll get what's called an order to show cause. Um, so the court has now noticed you have not filed one of your reports. Um, and so they are telling you that you have a hearing date and time your butt must come in front of the judge and explain to the judge why you didn't do this and you better have a good reason for it. Now, one of the safety mechanisms built in is that the orders to show cause are usually one or two months out. And as long as you satisfy whatever is outstanding, like basically before the hearing, but they say seven days before the hearing. Um, and then that gives the clerk enough time to review it. And yes, you've complied. So now we'll cancel the hearing. Now, if you keep going though to order to show cause hearings and you don't do what you're supposed to do they will terminate the guardianship they will say you no longer have you are not following the rules so yeah. you are no longer able to be guardian so yes they eventually will terminate the guardianship it's a it is a high bar yeah it's also right if you're ignoring a bunch of court orders and not doing what you're supposed to do you know you can't blame the court for them saying look that yeah. you're not a guardian anymore Wonderful. I have this one last question. I thought this was uh, interesting and, and it might be beneficial for others. So an uh, individual, they became the guardian of a, of a younger child with special needs. Um, it is a child. So will they continue to be guardian past the age of 18? Or what does that look like? Do they have to say, okay, they're 18 now, they're an adult, so they have to go through the guardianship process? Okay, that's a great question. So what happens is, is when um, we're talking about a minor child, it's the parents are the natural guardians, but if they are unable um, to serve as the natural guardians for whatever reason, then a guardian will be appointed. Um, that's going to actually depend on the type of guardianship um, that was appointed and whether it's going to continue past the age of 18 or not. Um, for example, if it's the guardian of property, that's going to terminate at 18. At 18, whatever money is in that account is given to that 18-year-old to do what they will. Um, so it really just depends on the actual factual circumstances as to whether it will continue or whether additional paperwork will need to be filed. Um, and also it depends on whether the ward agrees. Um, you know, at 18, maybe they see, okay, yes, let's terminate the guardianship over my finances, but now let's put them into a trust. So it's outside of the court system, so we don't have to worry about those pesky annual reports. Um, and then, but the trust is going to govern it, and whoever was guardian is going to be trustee, so they can manage those assets for the ward. And so it's not through the court system, but it's kind of still the same thing if that makes yeah. sense. Wonderful. Well, Kimberly, thank you so much for your time. I, there's still a handful of questions. We're trying to do our best to get back out to you all uh, and do our best to answer you. And then our contact information is up. So. Feel free to reach out to either our office, Able United, or, or uh, to the Civil Law Office to have additional questions. But Kimberly, thank you so much uh, for your time. I think this was valuable. Got a lot of thank yous uh, in, in the questions and comments. So appreciate your time. And thank you all for uh, just attending and taking some time out of your day to learn more. Uh, a link will be sent out after uh, probably tomorrow. And also you can check the Able United YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com backslash Able United for all of our previous recorded webinars. So once again, thank you, Kimberly, and you all have a wonderful rest of your day.